and staying with stocks. Is this the start of the Christmas rally? Is this it for his opening calls? Let's bring in James Gerrish from Shaw and Partners and author of Market Matters. Is this it? I doubt that very much, James, but what do you think? Is this the Santa rally? Yeah, good morning to you uh, guys. It's certainly starting on the right foot. Uh, obviously, uh, some big moves overseas as the uh, Omicron uh, variant sort of uh, dissipates into the background uh, somewhat. Uh, and we see some money move back into the tech space. So it's obviously been a volatile uh, couple of weeks. The market's um, corrected some sectors more than others. So it's been a pretty aggressive move in some of the small cap plays here locally and overseas. It's been a pretty aggressive move uh, lower in the tech space. Uh, here and overseas, uh, but those themes reversed pretty strongly last night. So, you know, to me, I think it's, it, to me, it s sets up pretty positively for the back end of the year. So Christmas rally, I think we're on. <laughs> All right. I uh, like the sound of that. Yep. Uh, but of course, there are other issues. To <laughs> Maybe a couple of bumps on the way. <laughs> well, uh, there's that CPI figure at the end of the week as out of the states is concerned. I mean, there are some potential uh, roadblocks ahead. There, there always are, Andrew. So there's always things in the market that, um, you know, that we've got to digest. But one of the things that I guess warms my heart around what the market has done is its resilience. And that's been a case over the last 12 months where the market has uh, dealt with some pretty major issues. Obviously, you know, a new variant that's more, uh, that, that's more um, uh, that, 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 that can move around the society more than the Delta strain, that's a big issue. The rise in interest rates globally has been a major issue. Um, we've had a bunch of other factors that have uh, sort of hit markets and could have derailed this recovery. But the thing I take out is that um, you know, the, we, we talk about it a lot and I don't want to you know, brush over it again, but the huge amount of liquidity that have gone into the system over the last um, you know, 12 to 24 months, you know, the rate of change in money supply is, is, is nothing like we've ever seen historically. So um, you know, I think that speaks to the resilience or supports the resilience of the market. Uh, and the fact that we haven't fallen over when we perhaps should have uh, and had reasons to over the last little while speaks to the um, underlying strength in this market. So for me, I'm, I'm bullish going to the back end of the year. Mm. I know the Christmas rally gets spoken about a lot, but there is significance or statistical significance around it. And that's why um, sort of we hang our hats on it uh, each and every year. It doesn't play out every year, but I think there's statistical significance to it playing out. There's still plenty of cash, as you say. James, of course, just the last couple of boxes to be ticked with oil search. So what is the way forward from here? Yeah, Santos oil search, uh, that merger looks very likely to go ahead. So that's going to become the biggest uh, oil and gas producer on the Australian market, both in terms of you know, market cap, in terms of revenues, in terms of production. Here in Australia, it's going to be a top 20 global energy company. Um, so obviously it brings it into the, you know, it, it brings it greater scale, more diversity. Um, and to me, it's at a time when, um, you know, consolidation and scale is really, port really important in that energy complex. So it's a good deal, more so probably for Santos shareholders, uh, West Santos shareholders. Um, and, and, you know, I'm after a, a pullback in the oil price, I think if you've got a positive view around uh, markets going to the back of the year, you've got to have a positive view around uh, the oil price, um, which to me looks good here. And I think Santos looks um, particularly attractive at these current levels. And um, James, elsewhere, just get some news obviously today with the Treasurer Josh Frydenberg looking mm. to legislate just to reduce financial stability risks. Uh, this is in the payments mm. sector. Um, I don't know whether you've had a sort of stuck your head into this and, and seeing what's proposed, but what are the implications do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, payments have been a huge uh, topic of debate, both from a you know, markets point of view, a regulatory point of view, a political point of view, uh, over the last 12, 18 months or so. Obviously, the rise of um, alternative payment systems and um, ways we go out there and pay for goods and services comes with uh, you know, an added um, uh, impost from a, or added complications around how you regulate these things. And you, know, you think about the incumbents, which are obviously the banks, they've put a lot of money into... Uh, the financial system, the, the payment system, and then they're uh, getting undercut, if you like, from some of these new um, ways to pay for things. So uh, the Treasurer, it seems today, is going to uh, detail some, or in, at least flag his intention on 
uh, creating some more structure around this. I think ultimately from a market's point of view, um, that's a positive for the um, existing players. So um, it's a positive for the banks. It's not necessarily a negative for all the, the new payment players out there. If you've got, if you're already in the market and you've got some scale and you've got earnings, it creates a higher barrier to entry for new entrants to come in there. So, um, you know, it sort of levels the, uh, sort of, um, you know, solidifies your position in the market, if you like. So I don't think this is an overly negative thing. I don't think it'll come as an overly, um, uh, you know, shocking surprise from a market's point of view. Um, but more detail and clarity will be key, I think. So uh, watch this space is my uh, view there. Yeah, I'd have to say, James, whenever you mention payments, people just tune out. But as soon as you say crypto payments and digital payments, suddenly it gets all the attention. Because just this morning, for example, like 30% of payments are outside of the scope of APRA, ASIC and regulation. So it's a pressing issue. Why do you think it's suddenly on the market now? Why now? Well, I think this has been building for a while. So I don't think it's suddenly just come up and, and, and pushed its head into um, our realms of discussion. I think it's been bubbling away in the background for quite some time. No doubt the banking space has been putting pressure from a, on, onto governments to start regulating it. We've seen, we know that Matt Common out of CBA has been pretty vocal around uh, you know, the, the, the strategies or the policies that Apple employ. Uh, he believes they're anti-competitive. We've seen similar sort of discussions from other banks uh, here in Australia. So, you know, to me, I think payments are a really critical aspect of, um, you know, our Australian economy. Uh, and we need to be, there needs to be structure in place that we're um, sort of ensuring that, uh, you know, payments remain uh, stable, they're, they're well regulated, and that consumers overall have confidence in our payment system. You know, crypto brings so many challenges in terms of the payment space. Um, you know, there's so much, um, uncertainty around how crypto will be rolled out and how, how it will be regulated and how the consumer will be protected. So um, to me, it's a huge issue. It's going to continue to be a big issue. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's not going to be the last we hear about it, but that, that, that's certainly for sure. So 2022 is going to be a big year in terms of regulating um, the payment space, no doubt.